the order. We came out of a brief executive session. Um, we'll go to announcements. Brian, do you have some announcements? Um, yeah, actually, uh, I assume you're going to talk about Springs Fest and um, fireworks and yeah, and fire. Are you, are you going to talk about all that? Okay. Um, so I did want to mention that uh, Jack Klein is having a Yellow Springs bike tour on. Uh, Not Jack Klein. It's um. Yeah, it's at his properties. Well, yeah, YS Bike Tour on July 8th, and um, also there's another meeting that the Yellow Spring Schools are having um, related to infrastructure improvements on July 11th. And I'll let you talk about. It. So tomorrow is Independence Day, the 4th of July. So we have our parade at uh, three o'clock through downtown. If anybody, and I think we all know by now that. Anybody and everybody is welcome in the parade, but you need to get down to Friends Care Center at 2 o'clock um, to stage for the parade. And the fireworks will be, people always ask when the fireworks are. Well, it's <laughs> when it's dark. Um, but the community band will be playing starting at 8 o'clock. So it will, um, it will be a nice evening <coughs> at, uh, at Gaunt Park. And then, as Brian said, on Sun, or excuse me, Saturday, uh, July 8th, we have Springs Fest. It's going to be out in uh, the yard of the Bryan Center. It is um, bands starting at noon and ending at 10. There will be a beer garden, and um, it's uh, music is curated by a local um, gentleman, um, uh, Connor Stratton, and it is it is uh, a paid event, so it's a little unusual for Yellow Springs, but it is a paid event. So, um, but we invite you to come. Some great, great music. Anything else? Okay. Um, moving on to the consent agenda, all that we have are the minutes of June nineteenth, the twenty seventeen regular meeting. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, reviewing the agenda, um, there was one item. If you in within the petitions and communications, there is um, information about a berm waiver for Home Inc. I would like to add that to new business. And we do want to um, we do want to keep as closely as we can with our time frames within the uh, within the agenda. <clears throat> Anything else? And uh, Judith, I, I know you like moving the uh, moving the staff reports up, but it <coughs> seems like a lot of our legislation is actually staff generated. So maybe we cannot do that. We can leave it at the regular time now. Um, so Brian, do you want to review petitions and communications, please? Okay, yes, and uh, we had quite a few. Um, so there was a letter that was submitted for our packet, but also in the newspaper from Lori Askland um, talking, I guess, in summary uh, that it's appropriate to expect visitors to contribute to um, the village costs that relate to their stays. Um, we also associated with that, I assume from Patty, there was an addendum about some details related to um, uh, village, uh, I guess, support with infrastructure for the hotel and economic development um, that was somewhere around 200,000. Uh, we're going to talk about the berm, so I'll skip those. Uh, Dorothy Bouquet um, uh, mentioned that implementing a lodging tax is important for affordability. Um, <coughs> We also had a memo from Chris Connard, our village solicitor, confirming uh, what we talked about at the last meeting related to the village's ability to implement a uh, lodging tax. Um, Ruth and Tony Bent uh, uh, provided a letter that talked about um, the need to evaluate increasing revenue um, by rethinking income tax. Um, and uh, history. What's that? The Black History. Yes, tour. yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, actually, that was the next one. We got both um, a some general information about the Black History tours, 
uh, that are being supported by the 365 project. And also Judith highlighted a letter that, um, uh, that we got from Chief Carlson about officers being involved in that. So uh, there are uh, six various tours that are throughout the summer and fall. Uh, they all start at the Mills Park Hotel. Um, NAMI submitted something, uh, well, uh, a notice about their July 20th, uh, third Thursday meeting. Um, they have a speaker from the Clark County Combined Health District. On our table, Bruce Bratman Miller said he doesn't have a strong opinion about a lodging tax, but if we do uh, do it, then uh, it should apply to all lodging that is uh, appropriate. Uh, John Gudgel, on behalf of the 365 Project, asked us to endorse uh, the policing guidelines as recommended by the subcommittee of the 365 Project. And um, I wanted to just briefly reference a document that Judith and I submitted. And um, there are quite a few documents here. And uh, just kind of highlight, uh, this is a proposal for um, where we uh, would suggest things should move with the uh, lodging tax, um, and that is to uh, establish a 3% excise lodging tax for the village of Yellow Springs to be levied on transient guests staying at eligible establishments across the board that provide one or more rooms. And uh, Judith, I don't know if you wanted to highlight anything about that one um. pager. Well, just, just to say uh, tonight, uh, well, there's also uh, Chris Conard, our legal counsel, had uh, answered some questions regarding the lodging tax, which is also in here. We're not going to have a discussion on it tonight. We've had two rather lengthy discussions already. We're not making any decisions tonight. Uh, and in fact, um, the next meeting, the second meeting in July, I'm going to be away. The first meeting in August, we are taking a vacation day, so we're not going to have a, another meeting until the third meeting, so the third Monday in August. And um, we felt like it was too long to leave since we were kind of working on a proposal, Brian and I, to just leave, uh, say nothing about it. So that's why we put it in uh, the packet so that people could see what it is that we're proposing. Um, and. You know, to be uh, just uh, to keep it very simple, we're proposing that you know this would uh, apply to all uh, all lodges lodgings that uh, people provide in whatever venues uh, for transient guests. Uh, so um, we there's a rationale there which I think is very good. Uh, Brian wrote most of this just to say he highlighted the expense uh, to the village and to the citizens of the village, which the fact that we're a tourist destination uh, town, uh, you know, has been solely, you know, has been greatly uh, on the a burden on the citizens. And so um, finding a way for guests to help, you know, just to help defray some of that expense. Um, so we intend to bring this back, to bring this to the council August 21st and September 5th. And we, uh, you know, it will be an ordinance in an ordinance form. And at that point, we will have two readings and discussions. Uh, any questions about Chris's uh, information will be answered at that time. Um, and, we, you know, so that will be a time when people can participate uh, as we finalize the decision on that. Um, that's in order for me to feel comfortable, I, I may not, I may have to recuse myself, but, and I don't know if this should be a new agenda, but on the agenda, but I want to know what work staff will have to do in order to enact this and what kind of regulations then will come in regard to the lodging establishments that are non-traditional lodging establishments. And I did want to say, on a separate note, um, uh, Chief Carlson uh, has sent out a note saying that he was encouraging uh, the police department uh, staff to participate in the Black History events, uh, and you know is offering them uh, 
to log their time for that and thinks it's very important uh, that there be participation. And I wanted to recommend to Patty, and she's not here tonight, but that we consider doing this for our entire staff. I mean, he's suggesting to, you know, choose two dates and participate in this as a way of, you know, more outreach into the community, and especially into, uh, more connections with uh, black members of our community. So I think that's really good. So anyway, we might want to come back to this or add it to another. That's Sounds it. good. Okay. So we're done with petitions and communications. Okay, public hearings and legislation. We're going next to the second reading uh, and public hearing of Ordinance 2017-12. You can read this in by title only. All right, this is repealing Section 1048.05 service charges of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, and enacting new Section 1048.05 service charges to provide the option of re reduced seasonal rates for sewer services for residents whose water use during summer months is greater due to gardening or lawn watering and to provide for bit provisions for separate water metering. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, I will um, turn this over to Melissa. Okay, so this ordinance was basically a um, partly a housekeeping issue and then partly an update due to the switch from quarterly to monthly billing. Um, this ordinance is um, uh, addressing two different sections. Uh, section G, which is the uh, summer sewer adjustment as we all call it. Um, we were basing this off of the uh, quarterly system and now we are monthly, so we are still going to uh, utilize the same process of equating this uh, adjustment to sewer. Um, so this is for water that is used for lawn and garden watering and uh, the water therefore does not go down the sewer. So this is an adjustment um, to people's bills. So what we will do is we will look at uh, water usage in December, January, and February, and then we will compare that to a customer's June, July, and August water consumption. And um, anything, any difference between um, the, the winter three months and the summer three months uh, will be credited as a um, sewer credit on their bill, which they will receive in September, up to 6,000 gallons. So customers need to apply for this. Um, we will have the application on our website. We had taken it down um, in order to uh, wait for this uh, ordinance and these changes to come through. So we will be putting that on the website this week so customers can print it out, uh, fill, it, fill it out, and uh, bring it to us, mail it to us. Um, just don't mail it in with your bill because if you do that, it'll go to Cincinnati and end up in the black hole of the U.S. Bank lockbox. Um, so just get it back to us, and um, then we'll be able to uh, reflect those credits in September. Uh, September's bill. So. Um, we is there also, a, I'm sorry, is there a deadline for getting those applications? Um, it just has to be done before, I would say September 1st, before the, uh, the bills are started to uh, be compared for that month's billing, which goes out at the end of the month. Okay. So it will be received on October 1st. Um, there's also a change, so anybody that lives in a uh, multi-unit housing situation, um, the landlord will be able to designate a particular tenant if there is an outdoor area. Um, so. That, that is one of the changes. And then um, uh, a change that uh, was made as a result of the last reading of this ordinance is Section H. Um, se Section H talks about sewer adjustment meters, and um, we did take another look at this at the request of uh, Councilman Hausch, and we are going to leave this in here. Um, we do have a few customers that use uh, larger amounts of water and have irrigation systems. So we are going to leave this uh, section in here. So H basically just addresses um, anyone that has larger amounts of water that they're going to be using that they would like to receive that sewer adjustment for. So if somebody uses over 6,000 gallons and they'd like to install their own meter um, and have that meter, then they are more than welcome to do that. And that's what this uh, section H permits them to do. Okay. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Council? This is the second reading and public hearing. I will open the public hearing uh, for comments. Seeing and hearing none, I'll bring it back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. Hempfling? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Housh? Yes. Intro? Yes. You lost your voice. Yeah. Yes. Or you're losing your voice. Yeah, Melissa, thanks again for, uh, I thought it was a lot of good work on clarifying what that uh, everything means. No problem. Uh, resolution 2017-32, we'll read this in by title only. All right, this is approving the finance director's 2018 tax budget for the Village of Yellow Springs. Okay. 
Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay, Melissa. Okay, so I'm busy. I was looking for a document that I don't think made it into the packet, but I can um, touch on it. So basically what the tax budget is, just to refresh everyone, is uh, basically what the county does is this is uh, they require us to um, have our first exercise in budgeting um, and what they do is they, they provide us with a form that uh, tells us how much property tax that we can anticipate for 2018. So. Um, there is a uh, form that's in there that's provided by the auditor. Um, it outlines the amount of taxes that we would receive in uh, property taxes. So next year, 2018, we're set to receive $1,036,000 in property taxes. And then it also breaks that down by um, what is inside the 10 mil limit limitation, which means outside of our levy. And then it also um, designates the amount of money that our levy would generate. So. 228000 for our general fund is uh, generated uh, by the property taxes without the levy. And so that equates to about a quarter of what we receive total. And then um, what we receive because of our levy is 778000 So basically what I do is I plug those numbers in and um, I put in some actuals from 2015, 2016. They have a, a particular format that they like to see this. So this is slightly different than what our normal budget looks like that I pr provide for everybody at the end of the year. So we've got 2015 actuals, 2016 actuals, and then um, I do some estimations for uh, 2017, how we might end the year. And then I also do estimations for 2018. So what, uh, what will happen with this is this is provided to the county auditor and they will supply me with our first uh, certificate of estimated resources for 2018 so that we can file our first uh, budget before the beginning of the year when we have all of our end of year balances. So um, what we have um, as part of the tax budget is we have the general fund and it breaks down all of our revenues. Um, I expect that our revenues will, will stay relatively the same. Um, I always take a conservative approach with our revenues, which means that I try to estimate just a, a slight bit lower. Um, and then with our, our expenses, um, what I tend to do is I try to estimate just a, a tad bit higher. So I, t I try to take a conservative approach. So revenues, I don't see or anticipate any major changes. Um, the second page, um, it actually breaks down um, the police department's budget separately, which is uh, labeled a, as security of persons and property. And we have those previous years and estimations for 2017 and 18. Um, the next page um, is the rest of our general fund, um, which is labeled mostly as general government. It also outlines all of our transfers. And then at the very bottom of that page, it shows um, what our estimated, our estimated ending <coughs> fund balances are. Um, and we are um, expected to have or maintain a relatively healthy general fund, I anticipate, going into 2018, which is always good. I know that a lot of our transfers have been minimal because of um, cutbacks in spending and just a more cons conservative approach overall, which is always a good thing. The next page that we have as part of the tax budget is our police pension fund. This is basically a separate fund in which all of our full-time police officers are paid out of. Um, so this is just their pension um, portion of their benefits um, in this separate fund, which has to be listed um, separately. And then um, we have our special revenue funds, um, which this is formatted just slightly different. Um, it doesn't have a lot of the previous year actuals on here. Um, it just basically is looking at uh, the, un the estimated unencumbered fund balance of January of 2018 and those expenditures just for that year. So there's not any historical information for the special revenue funds. A, a quick question about uh, the green space fund. Yeah. Does this anticipate um, the amount that uh, we dedicated for the agraria community solutions? Um, for an expenditure in 2018. I mean, that should be out. Didn't we already expend that money? What was the What was the project again, Brian? I'm sorry. Uh, community solutions to, to come to land. That's already been paid. Okay, so yes. that's that's already Correct. anticipated. Yes. Okay, great. Yep, I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't get the question right off. I thought it was a 2018 question. No, that's already been expended. Okay. Um, 
and I had also uh, basically with the transfers into the capital improvement funds um, you'll see the budget year estimated receipts in there um, I did allocate money for the green space again as well as the capital project funds as well kind of um, continuing that uh, that work that we'd started with allocating money there as well right I just didn't realize we had 180 so that's good and then also if we jump down to capital project funds mm -hmm. that was where I was wondering about um, our franchise fee is that does that what? it's remitted into the general fund gotcha okay. yeah cool Okay, and then the uh, last detailed uh, budget page uh, is the enterprise funds, which is formatted in the same way as the special revenue funds. There's not the history there, but it's the, the snapshot of 2018. And it's got our estimated unencumbered balances to the far right. Um, so the enterprise funds are always something that I watch very closely. Um, and they, they, are all, um, they are all slated to be in the black again, which is wonderful news. Um, the very last page that's um, completed is a schedule of permanent improvements or capital budget as we call it. Um, there's not a whole lot that's on here, um, so it's just 2018, which all of these items will, will come in front of council for further discussion later. So this was just a preliminary look of what's coming. Um, most of this was already provided to council last year because we look at the capital budget in five-year increments. So. Um, this is what was scheduled for 2018, um, and I know that there were some grants and things like that that were, were put on the horizon just to get council to start forward thinking about those things. Um, so that's basically it for the capital budget, but I did have a one-page sheet, like I said. Um, somehow it didn't make its way into the packet, um, but basically it's a... Um, it's a look at all of our major fund balances. It broke down the general fund and then the um, enterprise funds as well. And um, somehow, I don't know if it made it into my packet. It should have. Um, I'm not sure where it went. Anyways, um, it, I, will, I will provide that information to council again once we do our, um, our permanent budget at the end of the fall. Um, it was just a one pager that uh, showed all of our projected end of year fund balances for 2017 and everything was in the black and it kind of gave a history. Um, so I've provided it to council a number of times and I just updated it so I can provide that um, at the next packet just so that it gets okay. people to start forward thinking. Good. So this is the entire packet. All of this information goes to the county? All of that goes to the county, um, yes. And then buried in the packet, um, it's towards the end, is the proposed 2018 budget schedule, which I know is already, um, Judy's already incorporated that into future budget items too. So we will start that at the second meeting in September, and then we will finish that at the first meeting in December. So I try to provide a buffer so that we're not doing the budget right up against the holidays, just in case of you know anything going on around that time where um, we might need to push things around so that's that so I'll take any questions if anybody has any um, I am curious how you what the uh, 2018 revenue estimate is based on by the county uh, in, in your uh, is that from the county? Um, the property taxes, yes. The county provides that information. That's what starts the tax budget. Gotcha. So basically, the tax budget is is kind of an exercise in us demonstrating our need for our property taxes. Okay. And income tax as well? Um, income tax is something that I project. And, and what's that based on? It's based on um, current year. So what I basically do, it's a very imperfect um, estimation that I do. I look at what's been brought in for the year. And I try to use that same basis for trying to figure out what we might bring in for the rest of the year. So I look at the last, um, when I did this, I had it, um, I had all of our revenues um, as of the end of May, all of the reconciliations done. So I looked at what we would brought in for the last five months, as well as utilities. That's how I figured that as well. Looked at what we would brought in for the last five months and just made assumptions based on those five months. The next seven months would continue in that fashion. Okay. So I guess... Not to be coy, I was curious if uh, you know an upcoming business that we think will go come to the community is contemplated in these numbers. Not yet, no. Okay. That would not be prudent. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Yeah, not one that might leave. 
So I'm yeah, sure. I mean, I I think she's she's actually being quite conservative, which I think is generally probably pretty good. Um, if we end up with more at the end, if something happens, I think that that's that that's a good thing. But um, I can understand her desire to be conservative. Any other questions from council? Questions from citizens? Thanks. Hi, my name is Dorothy Bouquet. Um, I just wanted a clarification on what um, enterprise funds were. I saw that you had the utilities listed in that. I just wanted to understand what it was. Yes, enterprise, um, they're classified, um, utilities are classified as enterprise funds because they're basically um, like their own mini business. Um, we take in consumer fees to be able to um, pay for that utility. So all of the money that comes in is used wholeheartedly to support that utility on its own. So it's considered an enterprise fund. So we have electric, water, sewer, and our solid waste. Okay. Those are the four. And you expect them to be in the black? In yes. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we will, uh, all those in favor, we're ready, we're ready to take a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next is resolution 2017-33, uh, title only. Okay, this is approving final legislation accepting a grant from Ohio Department of Transportation for safe routes to schools improvements. Uh, can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Uh, Melissa, I know this is yep. your project too. I can take this. It's a busy day for you. Yeah. Okay, so Safe Routes to School. Um, this is a project that's been in the works for longer than I've been working here. Um, so I'm really excited that this is starting to move forward. So um, this is a pro forma resolution that um, the Ohio Department of Transportation asked us to pass prior to them um, putting out to bid the project, which is going to start construction, I think, in August. Um, well, construction might not necessarily start in August. I think the bid is supposed to be let in August. So this legislation is the kickoff to that, which is great. Um, what this uh, project is doing, um, just to refresh everyone's memory, is it is providing a sidewalk along Yellow Springs Fairfield Pike from Fair Acres to Winter Street and along Winter from Pleasant to Yellow Springs Fairfield. Um, so they are going to be installing sidewalks, which is a great thing, and 100% um, of the cost is going to be provided by um, the Ohio Department of Transportation. They're going to select the contractor, and they will uh, begin that work um, in just a few short months. So I'll keep everybody updated once that really starts to move, but we're waiting for the project to be let right now. So that means if they're putting it out to bids, that means the, the engineering work is done? Yeah. How, so how much did it end up, is it ending up costing approximately? We? There are a number of different numbers that are in my head as it relates to that project, and I didn't bring up my folder tonight. Um, so I think it was in the $300,000 range was what that was, because I know that it was a smaller project and then it was expanded um, and this has literally been going on I think since 2012 so it's been a it's been a process yeah. but mm -hmm. I think it was in the three hundred thousand dollar range just to say I think it's really important in terms of safety uh, children walking from that neighborhood up to school or biking right it's really good well and hopefully we're gonna be on the right track to apply for another one once yep. we get this one down um, Melissa, uh, two questions I have. One, um, are we still extending the sidewalk yes, up to Stafford? Okay. we are. I have been um, working to make sure that all staff are on board and um, communicating all of this every step of the way with them. So Jason's aware that the bid should be let very soon. Once I get that information from um, ODOT, I'm going to make sure that he's in contact so that full coordination does happen for that. So whether we use their contractor or we mobilize our own, I'm hoping that that's going to be very seamless, that extension. So. Okay, good. And um, I guess my second question is, based on what you're saying about the bid being let in August, um, so we're talking about, I mean, still in the fall? Yes, we could it's, see it's it. going to happen this fall. Correct. All right, good. Okay. Sure, Chrissy, come on up, please. I just want to uh, know, uh, I have a packet from St. Fruits to School when it was first all approved and everything, and wasn't there a plan also for a sidewalk to be built around the 
two streets of Mills Lawn, that there's not a sidewalk, Limestone and Phillips. I thought that was part of the safe routes. Um, the whole grant funding for that program, that there would be, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there, I know what no you're talking about. It, it, yeah, was, we, it was part of it, but there just did. wasn't enough funding. I mean, there were, there were, there's a much larger Safe Routes to School plan that's been mm -hmm. developed. But this, it was decided, the group got together and decided that, that for the money that was available, that this was the priority project. So this is the project that they pursued. So right. then are we still going to be looking into some way to put sidewalks there? Because I think everybody agreed that would be a place that would, it, it would be really nice to have a sidewalk all the way around. Uh, middle school property. Yeah, two things that are happening with that. One is the council goal to have an active transportation plan and sidewalks will be part of that. But the second thing is, as I mentioned, now that we've completed a safe routes to school project, we should continue to apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And it's too bad that it's taken so long to get the rest of it together that the big, uh, the beautiful little bulldog footprints that were painted around town are most of them are faded away now, so it would be great if we could get to see those get redone. Or, anyways. All right. Thanks, Thanks, Chrissy. Any comments or questions from council? Comments or questions from citizens? <coughs> Bring it back to council table. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, next is 2017-34, Judy. Do you want this? Uh, let's, let's go ahead and read this one in full. Okay. This is adopting guidelines for policing for the village of Yellow Springs. Whereas the village of Yellow Springs prides itself on having a police department that respects, respectfully serves our community, direct, directly responds to the needs of citizens, and actively ensures the safety of residents and visitors. And whereas this is accomplished through adherence to principles and practices developed through collaboration among council, the village manager, the chief, chief of police, staff, and citizens, and whereas collaboration has been provided for and encouraged by council with resulting information used to develop the guidelines for village policing attached to this exhibit A. Now, therefore, the Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Council for the Vill Village of Yellow Springs hereby accepts the attached guidelines for village policing as guiding principles to be used by the village manager and the chief of police in developing and carrying out policing policies and by Yellow Springs police team members in serving the community. Section 2, Council hereby certifies that support of this vision is in accordance with village values regarding provision of a welcoming community that serves and protects people regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, economic status, ability, or religious affiliation. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, so I will turn this over to um, either Brian or Marianne, who both worked on this project. Marianne. Um, the impetus for this uh, change, uh, which I think originally maybe we called the vi a vision for local, local policing, yeah. came from uh, work initially done by council uh, a couple years ago. It's not clear that it was adopted in any way at that point. And um, I think then the next thing that happened given the uh, Village Justice System Task Force was that 365 um, indicated that they would be interested in taking the original document and making some suggested changes, which uh, a subcommittee of that organization did. It initially came to council then. Council sent it to the Justice Task Force. The Justice Task Force discussed it, made some recommendations. It came to council. And at that point, Brian and I said, we would review that document. We did. Uh, we included some of the changes that the 365 group and the Justice Task Force had uh, suggested. Uh, and that's the document you see in front of you. Uh, it, I sent it to Brian Carlson, uh, who looked at it and approved it. It was also sent back to 365. Um, and I'm and there was some discussion of 365, so I'll just leave it at that. So would somebody, are we looking at the second page with Okay, I had put, I had put uh, a note, which somehow didn't get in the packet, explaining that I was going to suggest a couple of uh, 
changes or additions, basically, uh, which are the underlined. And okay. um, the reason um, what happened was I had called Brian saying, and I think there needs to be more explicitly anti-racist language in this document, uh, given <coughs> Uh, given the Black Lives Matter move, movement and what it is responding to in terms of that, the history of that relationship with that community. And um, he said, well, uh, actually there was language that had been in there from the 365 project and he, you know, sent it to me. So rather than me rewriting it, I thought I would just look to what they had written. So uh, that was part of it, but then this, this second pad uh, paragraph so that so that so that there's two places I was going to um, s suggest that we make uh, some addition. The first one is the second paragraph of the uh, introduction. Uh, this was language that was from the 365 project, uh, which I would like to make a motion that we add in. And then the on the second page, under dem demonstrably inclusive. Um, the underlined is language that I am uh, recommending to council. I wanted to make a motion that we add in and the Before we oh sorry go ahead and the um, the part that the 365 project had had in there was just the uh, the first the first sentence the additional two words and anti-racist. Um, I was it was suggested because I talked to Janet and Gavin. Um, that I look at that there was a specific uh, meaning to that concept of being anti-racist and that I might want to look to that and so basically what I did was quote that in the second sentence the second sentence there uh, it came from Ontario uh, their anti-racism secretariat and then I added a couple little bits as you can see that's underlined there so maybe um, I don't know if, if we want to discuss those. Can, can I get some clarity first? Yeah. Sure. So this first page is a document that's been written and approved by the police the department, yeah. by, by Marianne and Brian in the 365 group. And 365, um, there were some significant edits, um, I think, by Marianne and um, Brian that uh, you know, they just decided they just wanted it to go through, but that they had recommended. So I just took it back out, and I thought we should discuss it here. I don't think okay, that's a right. lengthy you're, discussion. You're, you're stepping ahead. Okay. I do, I want to understand what this yes. first piece of paper first is. First piece of paper is right. things that come from the original document that we did, 365 edition, Destus Task Force edition and edits by Brian and myself. So this has essentially been through a lot of people yes. and a lot of process. Yes. So the second piece. The second of paper, one is the same okay. document, just with those additions. I, so, I am, yeah. I'm just okay. trying to That's get clarity yeah. because it wasn't very clear to me in the packet the yeah. way it was Sorry presented. That. The there was an extra piece that got missed um, in the packet. So so what your so the second page you're proposing the addition of the the addition and change of everything that's black underlined, dark black, bold black, underlined. Right, right. Okay. exactly. Yeah, I mean, Brian had said there was some pushback from the 365 project to include these things, although, like I said, I added a couple of lines on that part under demonstrably inclusive, and when I talked to them, they just more or less said, we just want to get it finished, and, you know, we didn't want to discuss it anymore, but I didn't, I didn't get the sense that they had actually thought it was necessary. They weren't they like the idea of adding it back in, okay. put it that well, way. The I, two I, people I talked to. I guess I'm just, I'm uncomfortable because, yeah. you know, this first document is something that, you know, council has kind of been counting on all of these folks to be collaborating on this document. And that's what I hear that we have. And now I'm very confused about whether there is a meeting of the minds on your recommendations, Judith. No, there's not. I'm I'm oh. bringing it as a I'm bringing it as a motion. So to, so to, who is, yeah, who to, has seen it and looked at it? I talked with well, I guess Brian, Marianne have seen we, it. Okay, Brian. And it came okay, from two Brian's working on this. Which you know, Brian? Brian. Okay. Pausch and Marianne and Janet Mueller. I mean, they took it to the 365 project. They made it very clear to me it was okay by the 365 project. So they. Uh, 
But I just think we should discuss the merits of it and decide whether we want to do it or not. If we don't think there's merit, if the council as a majority doesn't think there's a merit, then we won't do it. I mean, I mean, this is all getting, you know, I'm, I'm personally really counting on these folks to bring the language. They brought the uh, language and, and, and then I think Brian and Marianne offered to edit it a little more and I, and, um, you know, my understanding was it was going to be just, you know, kind of a... Can, okay, can, so can somebody the document, speak to the added language? The document that came through 365 and then had some edits from, uh, I guess actually Pat, Deweese, came to Brian and myself. I, we, I, I actually did the first initial edit, mm -hmm. omitted some of the things that the 365 uh, subgroup had put in. One, because I think a shorter document, I mean, I don't think more words necessarily makes a better document. And I felt that what was taken out was all, either already included in here or was not necessary or was right. inaccurate or confusing. So Brian and I both thought that this document worked. The 365 subgroup uh, said, well, why did you do the, why did you make those changes? We responded to them and they said, okay, they may not have liked them, but my feeling was this is coming from, at this point, this is a village document coming from village council. Okay. I mean, I think we should just discuss it on the merits. If, I mean, we always make, we certainly have the right as a council to hear in a public discussion, make some changes, and that's what I'm suggesting. I'm not demeaning the work that's been done. I talked with a few people. I thought that these things, we should consider adding them back in, and that's all I'm saying. So I guess I want to make a motion that we add in that second paragraph um, under the under the uh, introduction, as well as the additions. Well, I was going to do them separate. Oh, okay. That's what I was thinking. Okay. But if there's not a second, there's no discussion. And it looks like we won't. So you want to move on to the second one? All right. All right. Uh, second one, um, so I added in. So the village of Yellow Springs aims to be not simply tolerant, but proactively inclusive and, 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 and the addition is an anti-racist. Uh, the village of Yellow Springs and our police department commits to identifying challenging and ch change identifying challenging and changing the values, structures, and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism. That's the, uh, the um, description of, of anti, being anti-racist uh, from, I, I just quoted it because I thought it was good. And so it came from Ontario's anti-racism secretariat. And then I added in, you know, that it says our officers are expected to engage with all community stakeholders and it, it listed several stakeholders. I added in community of colored churches and civic groups and all faith-based faith communities. And then the third change was talking about attracting and retaining uh, police officers and I, and I just added in a diverse workforce. Uh, in our police department. So those are the changes that I'm suggesting. Okay, I will second that motion to have the discussion about it. So. And I, and I just said very simply that I just, I think that be given uh, the, the, the fact that there is a uh, national movement called Black Lives Matter and there, it's, it's the fact of that is there is a reason for that. Um, and it has to do with you know, a history and a relationship that has been broken uh, that needs to be, uh, that we need to note in a very proactive way um, that, you know, we expect actually our village government and uh, our police to be working, you know, against that, that long history and, pro and bringing healing. So that's why I added that in. A question for you. Yeah. Uh, Reading the, uh, the second sentence where it says the village prioritizes uh, equi 
It's supposed to be equitable practices. Oh, that, so that, I think that's yeah, missing. practices of hiring. Yeah, that's what practices is in the original. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And then as it goes on, it says stakeholders include youth, parents. Now the bold and underlying was that always there? No. Just highlight. I no. I so so what was there? Nothing. It, 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 it just on. it just went to business owners and entrepreneurs, local okay. Edu okay. education. And, and then and the, the last sentence for those uh, collaborative relationships, it says that the YSPD needs to attract and retain. And I just added a diverse workforce. I so mean, so before it was... It just wasn't it there. It was, it was officers. Okay. Officers okay. who are open. And, and excited. Yeah. yeah. And I thought we might, we should uh, broaden it beyond officers because okay. within our PD there's people who work there who are not officers. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like that addition and I also mm -hmm. like adding the faith-based, the, mm -hmm. yeah. the churches of color and civic groups in faith-based communities. It should have been in there in the first place. So, mm -hmm. although I guess social justice could have covered churches but right and, the, and actually those were those were from judith those were those not, are from me those were not in the document right. we received right. from the 365 right. project yeah i definitely like those additions i agree um and i just wanted to say i mean for me unlike the second paragraph to the introduction which i agree with marianne um i think it's already implied and stated mm -hmm. I, I do think these are substance substantive differences that make the document better um, Marianne, do you want to talk about how you felt about anti-racist or? Well, I guess anti, to me, anti-racism seems, uh, I don't like a negative, negative. That, that was what, that, that was the main thing that I didn't like about that. Um, well, anyway, that, that is. And I guess in terms of the next sentence, community of color churches, it would seem to me that, oh, in all faith-based. Mm -hmm. I don't know that, I mean, it, it, we need to single out community of color churches. It seems like it would be all churches. Uh, how about if that, in that first sentence, if we just take out, we just put the, put the period behind inclusive and then but contis and so take out an anti-racist, which Marianne was uncomfortable with, but then keep in that second sentence. I mean, I do think okay. that's a, a constructive statement, and it, it, it says that, right? So I like that suggestion. What do we want to do at sentence by sentence? I don't know. Yes. Okay. So... Uh, so uh, I, I guess, guess I guess I do have one more thing. Um, I mean, racism is a systemic part of our culture mm -hmm. and our government and everything in this country. Saying that our police department is going to be identifying, challenging, changing it, the values, structures, mm -hmm. and behaviors that perpetuate systemic racism. I don't know. Is that? It seems like that. It says the village, uh, the village of Yellow Springs, and our police department and commits police department. to. I didn't, you know. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Cruz, I talked with Judith about these changes today, and when we were first talking about it, I kind of uh, had second thoughts about the anti-racist thing in there too, because it seemed to me at first it was like he saying, well we are practicing racism. But then when I thought about it some more and I realized that we are a country that is like overwhelmingly proven lately to be racist, um, that maybe it's more innovative to abs absolutely come right out and acknowledge it, that there is racism in every area of our country, in our police departments, and even in a very liberal community like ours. 
So it, because of that, like I said at first, I was thinking, oh, we don't need to put that negative anti-racism thing in there. Of course, we're all striving to be anti-racist. But then on the other hand, I, I think maybe it is important to put it in there and acknowledge it. Acknowledge that it's part of what goes on in this country and that we don't want to be part of that. And we're not perfect and we haven't overcome it either. But we want to work towards that goal. So that's just what my thoughts on that. I'm thinking about inclusive and welcoming to tie it, to tie it back to our one of our council goals. Mm -hmm. And I think there's another. Okay. When you're oh, sorry. Go ahead. So my name is Norita Alexander, and I just have a question, and that is, what is the measure? What would the measure of anti-racist be for the village? <laughs> Thank you. Good question. And I wonder, I mean, if, if <coughs> systemic racism, sexism, I mean, are, are, there, other, are there other sorts of, of um, negative behaviors that we should be calling out or negative kind besides just racism? I mean, I know that that is really a focus right now. I know with Black Lives Matter, it's a focus. Um, and and I you know I'm I'm as concerned about it as anybody. But are we being a little too narrow in our in our focus? I I don't think we are. It's the, to me it's you know for years and years and years people have skirted around the issue, and to me this brings the issue to the forefront. And it basically says that we as a community and as a police department, that's what we're going to start striving for and we're saying it versus, you know, to me, you're either on one side or the other. And I think we all should be moving in the same direction. You know, we're a small community, but it's got to start somewhere. <laughs> and, and I feel that's what we're doing. We're making a start. We're making a statement. Okay. I mean, I kind of thought what the chief, you know, is encouraging of his uh, staff, you know, to, you know, learn about the black history of Yellow Springs to, you know, it's a, it's a very proactive thing to, for him to be saying, not only do I encourage you to do it, but I'm supporting you in doing it by, you know, you know, log in and go. And uh, I, I just think that's the kind of, uh, that's one little measure of saying, you know this. Uh, this is important that we're more knowledgeable. That we have relationships with people in our community across the racial spectrum, and uh, and that we're actually actively doing things to try to make that happen. And so that's part of the reason I was really pleased to see you know your little note to your staff. <coughs> So where are we on this? Well, so do, uh, I mean, I don't know. Do we want to vote on it? So, so are we going, do we just want to vote on the whole thing? Or the whole thing? That that's up to you guys, because I'm going to vote for all of it. Okay. <laughs> well, is there any more discussion before? We, we will take out Ontario anti-racism secretary. Right. Okay, we, maybe we, we put to it in quote them. and, okay. And then, well, because it's a public document, so we can. Okay. We can just and then. Steal it. Yeah, and then secondly, a small thing, but um, if we can take the and away from uh, in front of all faith-based communities, so it's just a continuous list. Okay. Oh, okay. Sure. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and I have one question back to the first page. Yeah. Uh, are we now going to, and, and maybe we do, and I'm just not aware of it, are we going to refer? Refer to our police officers as peace officers, or are we going to continue to refer to them as police, police officers? Well, Chief Carlson's taken the lead on peace officers. Okay, I like so that. Is it, did we not? Did well, we it's not consistent. But where is it it's not consistent? I thought we did safety make centered. safety-centered police in the middle, about in the middle. Well, it says police department. Or, see, the, I understand the police Which is department. different from, we're not going to yeah. say peace department, yeah. maybe. More concerned for how we're going to address our officers. I'm pretty police sure it's consistent, because that was one of the things I looked for okay. when I went through. Um, 
I mean, Judy, if you catch anything, but I, I think we should be consistent. But the intent is. Yes. Good. Okay. I, I just I want to. I was going to say, I just wanted to say to Ms. Mrs. Alexander, um, is that right? I'm, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think thinking about, you know, what is the measure and, you know, but that's true of this whole statement, you know, in terms of what we're, so um, I think, I think well, that we need to be looking at that. And actually, I'd like to follow up on that because <laughs> Um, to me, one of the most important pieces of this is the 365 project subgroup uh, wanting to support how we implement um, these guidelines for village policing. And so working with um, you know, our department and Chief Carlson on that. And that's why also um, I, I do want to mention one of the things Mary Ann said uh, to the group is things like that, for that second paragraph that we did not include would be a great sort of note to submit to council to say, or to the police department to say, here are things to think about, you know, to kind of comments to the policy. And so I'd love to see that happen and, and moving towards how do we measure these kinds of things. Um, so. Right. So for to, are we ready to kind of wrap up? I'd like to yes. kind of wrap up this yeah. last paragraph. So we're keeping an anti-racist. Is that what we decided? Mm -hmm. Okay, and we're taking out Ontario Anti-Racism Secretariat. We're we're removing um, and from before all faith-based communities. We're actually adding practices in up above the sentence before that. The village prioritizes equitable practices of hiring, and we're adding in the the suggestion of a diverse workforce. So, um, and we had a motion and a second on that. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 So now we'll go back Thank to you. the entire, let's, before we vote on the entire document, we'll um, see if there's any other comments from citizens. Chief, you happy? Happy, and <laughs> I mm -hmm. want to say thank you for the dedicated insight to this. This is a could set national standards for a guideline to follow. And uh, it will be implemented. Um, it will be part of hiring, uh, testing, memorization, <coughs> and of course, put into practice. And evaluation? Evaluation. Um, <coughs> the measure for us in the department for evaluation in, is the reaction and response that we're getting from the community. So it may sound small, but for us, it's huge. Good. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, any other comments or questions? So we'll uh, take a uh, vote on the uh, language, the guidelines for pl village policing modified as we just agreed to. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 OK. Um, oh. That was not that one. Uh, next is reading of resolution 2017-35. This is authorizing the village manager to waive water and sewer tap fees and zoning permit fees for up to eight units proposed for the Glen Cottages Phase 1 Affordable Housing Project for Yellow Springs Home, Inc. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, I know that, that Emily is here. Um, this, and I also believe Melissa has been working on this. Um, I have not been oh, working on this one. Apparently, yeah. Melissa hasn't been working <laughs> on this. Um, so this is the uh, the next big project that Home Inc is working on. It happens to be a property on the south end of the village um, on uh, Xenia Avenue. Um, it's currently uh, not, about an empty acre of land. Um, quite lovely piece of land actually and uh, very well situated um, so we have Emily here from Home Inc to describe the project and uh, talk about what they're planning on doing sure and I did actually include a, I submitted a letter I don't know if it made it into the it packet did. or not okay. well it made it to our table well it actually made it into the packet no there's an updated letter that's well, you, on the table because you asked me to um, you asked me to rewrite the letter so that it had more statistics broken out and had, so I, I changed it a little bit. It's all the same information, right, it's just, just re presented differently. Yes. But I can go through it. Um, okay. 
Yes. So uh, Yellow Springs Home Inc. requests Village Council support of our next affordable housing project, which is called Glen Cottages, um, by waiving water and sewer tap uh, fees and also zoning permit fees for up to eight units of affordable housing. And uh, as Karen said, this is on a 1.02 acre parcel of land. It's really a, a nice location to support uh, intergenerational pedestrian oriented housing. It's also along the Green Cats bus line, very close to the Wellness Center and Antioch College, close to the Gaunt Park um, and the pool. And I mean, I, I just think it has a lot going for it. So um, it's being planned as using the pocket neighborhood design principles. I don't know if it's actually going to be a pocket neighborhood zoning overlay. There is no official pocket neighborhood zoning overlay, so uh, I guess it's a moot point right now. But we'll, we'll figure that out as we go along. So we're not asking for final project approval by any means. We'll go through the zoning process. Um, and so the pocket neighborhood design principles uh, were responding essentially to what we've heard from villagers, which is a desire for a type of residential living that encourages community, walkability, shared outdoor spaces, uh, high levels of energy efficiency, accessibility, and smaller building footprints in a cottage, really attractive sort of garden cottage style. And so we hope to develop a neighborhood that's comprised of single family and attached garden cottages. Uh, and it'll be a mix, we anticipate a rental and for sale. And it will be a mixed use project, um, partly out of a result of our broadening focus, because we realize that we have to create a variety of different kinds of affordable housing to meet the uh, really enduring and increasing need for affordable housing. So uh, phase one will result, uh, we anticipate in up to six rental units and two for sale units affordable to households that would be making between 50 and 80% of area median income. And that's approximately uh, 22,000 a year in income to up as much as 50,000 a year in income depending on household size. Um, and it'll, phase one will also feature um, some accessible or adaptable housing that uh, will also uh, benefit seniors uh, who are aging in place as well as um, household with special, households with special needs. Um, and so then we'll plan a subsequent phase is the idea. Um, and so we're asking for a fee waiver right now at this point in the planning before there's even a site plan, um, primarily to help leverage $350,000 in grant funding from outside of the community to help make the project possible. The soft costs for, uh, even this is, though this is kind of a big project for us and will make an impact in Yellow Springs, it's a small project in the world of affordable housing. Um, and so uh, one of the benefits for a tap fee waiver and zoning permit fee waivers is that um, it lowers the soft costs, which are already high because it's a smaller number of units relative to the other projects we'll be competing against for funding. Um, and so on August 1st, we're gonna submit, we hope to submit two funding applications, one for <laughs> up to six rental units and another one for up to two for sale units. And that would be, again, for $350,000 to the Federal Home Loan Bank of Cincinnati um, to fill the gap between what we can charge in rent that's affordable to someone making between 50 and 60% of area median income uh, or in the for sale for someone making up to 80% and the total cost to develop. And it's significant, um, the gap. But for the Forest Village Homes Project, we had to raise almost $900,000 for six units. Um, and that enables us to keep the rents low over a, you know, a generation or more. So we have to project way out in the future with costs. Um, and so it is a competitive scoring criteria to get local support. Um, it will result in a more competitive funding application. Um, but a full fee waiver would also go a long way in showing local support to funders um, such as the Ohio Housing Finance Agency. And we do for this first project phase anticipate going in for an additional at least $700,000 in, um, 
in funding applications. And I know for the OFA, while it's not a competitive scoring criteria, um, they did cite the tremendous local support for Forest Village Homes as one of the reasons that they gave us the funding, uh, which was competitive. Um, I said earlier it, all, it, it reduces the soft costs, um, which in turn reduces the, either reduces the overall cost to develop or frees up some funding in our um, budget to be able to invest into amenities that directly enhance resident life. Um, and so, you know, I mean, so the, every cost is a trade-off, and so the, if we're spending money on tap fees, that means we can't apply it somewhere else. Um, also, we, just from pure economic development, um, we anticipate this affordable housing project phase to generate probably upwards of $1.2 million in local economic development. It will also improve infrastructure in a now mostly vacant lot in the high density residential corridor. Um, and we very conservatively are estimating um, upwards of 10,000 year in property tax revenues, uh, new property tax revenues over and above what's being generated by the vacant site. Um, and then, you know, I mean, there are, I think, some value-oriented reasons why affordable housing is important in our community. It meets, this project will meet local values as well as public priorities. Um, Village Council value number three is to be a welcoming community of opportunity for people of diverse races, ages, sexual orientations, cultures, and incomes. And I can't think of a better way to support that goal than by supporting um, affordable housing. Uh, affordable housing is also listed, as you know, as a top public priority in the comprehensive uh, land use plan, the 2010 visioning, and by way of incentives in the 2013 zoning code. Um, and I'm almost done, but I, I have to say every time I get up here that this meets a critical need in the village. Um, the need for affordable housing is growing and it's enduring and there are people that we all know and probably people that we don't realize are struggling with being housing cost burdened. Um, a 2014 study that we commissioned um, shut by Bowen National Research indicated that more than 43% of renters and 28% of homeowners in Yellow Springs today are housing cost burdened, meaning they pay more than 30% of their income to housing. Um, some people pay a heck of a lot more than that. Um, and once you cross that threshold, you feel it in other areas of your lives. Um, certainly, you know, in terms of the utility bills coming your way, medical bills, the cost of insurance, childcare, it all starts to add up really fast. Um, and we, we believe uh, very strongly, and I, I think the village does too, that affordable housing and income diversity uh, in particular really strengthen the vitality of our community. Um, and because, the home, because we're a community land trust, we're not walking away after the government mandated affordability period for the, um, this particular project. We'll be around as, as long as possible, um, ideally for generations, to make sure it continues benefiting um, the public good of affordable housing, as well as empowering low-income residents. Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Comments or questions? Well, yeah, I, I would like to recommend that we do the full waiver for the eight units, which would be $6,505. Um, I think that the value that we get from that, I mean, Emily has already said that, monetarily, the two grants, that would make this project competitive both for the Federal Home Loan Bank grant of 300000 And I can tell you it would also make us make the project competitive for the Federal Home for the Ohio Housing Finance Agency of $500,000, $800,000. So, so mm -hmm. Uh, 6000 for 800000 But the other thing is we, we've just supported um, uh, the Comps Land Trust effort to preserve farmland outside the village and to permanently, well, not just farm, not prefer, permanently preserve that land. This is the other side of that, permanently preserving land in the village for affordable housing in perpetuity. Um, I mean, Emily has gone through the uh, economic value and the 
uh, social values that we give and the housing values, but I see those two things as standing side by side. Mm -hmm. If we could preserve land outside the community for farmland and natural resource value, preserve land inside the value permanently for affordable housing. So that's my recommendation. Um. A, a few things. So first of all, I do want to uh, add to what Emily said. Y you know, we have several village values that are you know, tied into this project, like our value of lowering our, um, our carbon footprint and uh, not to mention a variety of village goals that tie to affordability. So, I, you know, I, that is also important, I think, in this. And um, Emily, just two things I want to clarify. Uh, is it true that, um, as the resolution says, that we're talking about uh, a waiver for phase one specifically at this point? Yeah, um, I, I think just because it is unknown how many units it'll end up being, because we don't have a site plan yet, I thought probably the most, um, the safest thing to do in terms of you knowing exactly what you're committing to would be to just bring phase one. Okay. In, unless you want to just approve the whole project. <laughs> Um, your discretion. Let's see. And then, uh, <laughs> yes. And then my second question um, is, can you just briefly elaborate on when you give us numbers like 3.5 million economic development for the 22 projects, you know, we currently have, or the 1.2 for, for this, um, what, where that number is derived, what you're talking about? So that's the total cost to develop, which, uh, not the ongoing cost, but the the total cost to develop. So that's not just the bricks and mortar, that's all of the soft costs, the land acquisition, the engineering fees, architectural, um, business planning. I mean, there's a lot that goes into <coughs> developing real estate, so it's the whole Does thing. that Do those numbers also include the property tax from improvements in the property? Just during the build phase. Okay. Um, in, in a rental project, we do uh, what's called an interim budget, and that's where the economic development number comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's also the, you have to do a minimum of a 15 year pro forma, but then it has to cash flow for 30 years, and that's a totally different thing. Right. Do you have any numbers in your head about sort of like pre and post improvement in terms of, you know, how that changed the property tax? Oh. Um, I'm not, I don't remember off the top of my head what the property taxes are on the unimproved parcel. Do you know what vacant lots are going for? But it's, it's a lot less. I mean, the, it goes way up. I think, I think we had budgeted something like $500 a lot is what we were getting for, uh, or being charged for the Cemetery Street lots. Um, and then once they were improved, I think the, the four together are generating almost fourteen thousand a year. Okay. So go, but, two to four. I mean, it goes way. It goes up a lot. But sure. didn't I hear you say that you were estimating it would be ten thousand dollars annually? And uh, it, that's tax. conservatively, since um, we. I, I anticipate it'll probably be a lot more than that. But I would say conservatively, ten thousand, okay. more than over ten thousand a year. Yeah, I do want to point out that in Forest Village, which is the Dayton Street project, we did. Um, cap it at the $500, and Emily has said that that was looked upon quite favorably by these lending institutions um, or these funders. So um, I, I guess I, you know, I, I absolutely support what Homing's doing. I absolutely um, uh, recognize that this is part of our village values, mm -hmm. part of our, our uh, visioning, part of what we want to do. But I also recognize that that there are a lot of other citizens in the village whose bills are going up and any utility rates are going up. So any any money we can retain within the system, um, I think is, is something to consider. Um, and Emily had said last week that the fi that $500 um, is, is kind of the minimum that they are looking at. Um, and there are two different funding applications and one is the federal home loan bank and the five hundred dollars does get you get does get you the points for that one and then later on we're i believe that a full waiver would probably be more compelling to the ohio housing finance agency so are you saying waiver. that you didn't get all the you're having issues with the funding on forest village since we no we're not having waiver no we're not having issues but i just i think given the 
the, the range of ways that a municipality can support affordable housing, a full waiver makes a stronger statement. Um, I, I had said something that was confuse, confusing to people the last time we discussed this because this comes out of our utility funds or you know the money's not going into the utility funds that you know did we want to some, another way we could do it is to pay the out of the general fund uh, you know that that fee I mean that would be another way to do it um, but I I feel like this isn't the place to be stingy and it's not that much money. Uh, and I understand, you know, Karen, I mean, I feel like the whole of council has been very supportive of affordable housing, which has been great. Uh, so but just to say, we're not talking about a huge amount of money. There's a very, I mean, the whole affordability issue is becoming such a dire issue within the village. Uh, and of course, you know, this, what, uh, Hom what Homique does in affordable housing um, doesn't touch the other affordability issues that a lot of people are struggling with. Mm -hmm. But and, nonetheless, and so I just, and I, I wasn't trying to say anybody yeah, was being okay. stingy, but just well, to but say, before, before we leave. It is important to, to, to consider, Patty did provide uh -huh. a sheet of all mm -hmm. of the investment we've made in Home Inc. Mm -hmm. projects to date and it's been pretty significant right. and so I think that you know I think the village has been generous I think the generosity especially on Cemetery Street because of the selling of the property at half value and because of the new water line was significant and um, so I think that I think that you know we, we just need we need to, to make sure that we're that we're giving ourselves credit and understanding all of the ways in which we have worked with Home Inc. Um, on several projects and we'll continue to work with Home Inc. And, and I guess I do want to just make sure this is totally clear. So from the summary we have, it looks like we've never um, given a full waiver on any of the projects. Is I, that? I actually think no, that have. Village Council has given a full waiver. I think that the tap, the cost of tap fees has has changed over the years okay. but it would be probably helpful to get clarification from Patty and I could also look at our records of what was committed to okay. other projects. Forest Village and I think I remember that now I mean the tap fees haven't, haven't changed mm -hmm. didn't change with Forest Village <laughs> that was just last year. But I think yeah. for West Davis Street they were more significant. And, that, that and could I think be, it actually that, does say that those it does appear that West Davis and Cemetery Street did give get or well, did get full. Not, not Cemetery Street according to this, but Davis maybe, it's unclear. So, but related to that, Emily, um, Ohio Housing Finance Agency, yes. um, you've applied to fu for funding from them in all these projects or? Um, no, that we applied and received funding for Forest Village Homes. Um, we did, we, they haven't funded home ownership for a long time. And that's what we've been doing. So uh -huh. it, it hasn't been an option on, on uh, most of the other projects. Okay. Um, so I want to make one more comment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about this. And I feel like a, an argument that hasn't been highlighted in uh, the great work that I think Home Inc. does is that you guys are truly a village partner that's actively going out there and land that I mean, I'm not sure that anybody's after um, or is planning to develop. You guys are putting in all this effort to make that happen. And I, I just want to emphasize that piece is that I, since I've been on council, I don't know of any other developers or organizations that are making you know, this proactive uh, you know, uh, jump towards this activity. And so I guess that ties into what Marianne said. I, I'm impressed by you know, not only does it tie to our village values, but it, we're also improving property in a way that supports the village and our community members. And I think, I think that's absolutely important, but I will say, that the waivers we're giving, the, the funding that they're getting is lowering the cost. For-profit for, for developers don't get the same kind of benefits. So developing property is much more expensive than it is for home inc because they're getting, um, they're getting low interest loans, they're getting waivers, they're getting funding in different ways. So I absolutely agree with you that the work they're doing is phenomenal. Um, I think that that the cost of development in Yellow Springs and the cost of property is making it more difficult for poor, for poor, 
for poor for profit developers to develop and and so I I, I, I don't want to diminish that I, I agree that there are a lot of building challenges in Yellow Springs and the only thing I would add to that is that we're competing against every other community in Ohio and most affordable housing agencies get the land for free they get it donated out of a land bank um, sometimes they get tax abatement I mean they're doing things on a big enough scale that the soft costs are a lot lower per unit and so we did have to overcome a hurdle with forced village homes and the cost per unit and I think that's tr I, I think every developer or, or potential developer in Yellow Springs faces that reality as they're looking at the, the big picture so, I mean, we are definitely in a competitive industry, too, even in affordable housing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I feel like it's a small amount of money we're talking about, and I, I don't understand. Uh, the, I, I, we've been very, we've done a lot f over the years in supporting the Home Inc. Uh, proposals, but it's been over many years, and, you know, this is a small amount of money for a, a very large good. And so I would urge council that we go for the full. We're talking about what sixty-five, six thousand five hundred, six thousand five hundred dollars. And so I, I, uh, I feel a little bad that I feel like we kind of uh, are always a little reluctant. And I don't. I wish. I mean, I don't understand. That we're what? We're always a little. There's always a little bit of uh, unease or reluctance, or it seems like a lot of times in these discussions. Um, I, I think it's important for the community to hear these discussions mm -hmm. and, and because there I mean I will be quite honest there are folks who who don't necessarily think we should be doing this so I think when we have these discussions good discussions I think that it helps explain okay. why we're doing this and it helps show the support we have yeah so, and I want to be clear I, I'm very supportive and always have been but I, I do want to make sure as Karen said that you know these issues are all clear what we're doing what okay. the intent is um, so I'm not comfortable with this the language of section 2 if we're gonna it seems to me it could be simplified just by saying full waiver if that's if that's where we are at no greater than I think that this was anticipating potentially not giving all of the waiver so if we're going to give a full waiver it seems that there's a much easier way to say this judy well the, i mean we the, only, the, the reason for the cap is that the zoning <coughs> fees are unclear it's unclear whether it will come in as beauty or pocket neighborhood development or it, the, the amount of the zoning so fees that's why i'm vary. saying it, it this yeah. having a particular number doesn't make sense it should be probably be something as simple as village government will take the form of fee forgiveness of all tap and permit fees are you making a motion i'll make that motion okay uh i'll second and i and i think we might want to consider whether we want this coming out of a different place than our utility you know it, like i say if we want to reimburse it to our utility well, so funds. Weigh in on that i mean not right so, now but could you i mean something we that? may want to consider I, yeah i would like to go back to patty's document though um because in looking at our tap fees um patty does touch on this in her report the last time our tap fees were increased um, appears to be 1986 and she does put in her report that the cost of the water tap equipment we supply is $450 a unit and our tap fees are only 375 so they have been um, long overdue for um, a look at tap fees in general yes I, I noticed that and I was going to suggest but I think it's a sec separate issue Correct. that staff that th these fees be changed to reflect the actual cost. Correct. So, but Melissa, just to clarify that, I mean, so we get 750. So, is it 450 times two? Is that supposed to be water tap? That's just water. $450 for just the water tap. So what the, about the actual cost of sewer isn't in here, and I'm not sure what that is. I don't know if that was still being gathered by um, okay. Jason because that would fall under his purview. Because so that, that's why I'm confused. Well, but the 375 and the 450. I mean, so those are just supposed to be tied together. So correct. the sewer. Correct. So, but there is equipment cost for sewer tap. Yes. Okay. And there are also labor costs associated with our staff. Sure. So let's, I mean, that sounds like I think you're hearing council um, give you the go ahead to start working on that. Okay. okay, so we've got a motion and whatever that last sentence was I just said. 
I hope you wrote it down, Judy. Are you saying village government contribution will take the form of fee forgiveness of all tap and permit fees? Is that what you Does want? that sound? Yes. Yes. Excuse me. Are you limiting that to phase one? Yes. yes. That's, that's in the resolution. That's section one. Okay. Yeah, we won't change that. <coughs> okay, so we have to vote on that one. Okay, yes. Um, is this, are we, are we voting on that amendment? Yes, because okay, I, so, I have another amendment. Okay, so we'll vote on that amendment. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Um, I'd also like to make a motion to add a whereas, because um, I think it's important that we refer to our village values and council goals. Um, and I think it can simply say that, Judy, um, if, if we vote to add that. But I, I think that's not highlighted in here. And again, this is intentional investment in economic development. What is um, the whereas? Uh, whereas because this you know, um, furthers our village values and council goals, I did not write it down. Should have had Emily's so. document. Emily's document uh, references village council value number three to be a welcoming community of opportunity for people of diverse races, ages, sexual orientation, cultures, and incomes. Is I guess I'd, ra like I'd rather say? broaden it though because probably at least three of our village values apply to this. Okay. So, you know, whereas this, how about, whereas this is an intentional investment in economic development that furthers village values and council goals. So that's my motion. It. So motion and second. All those yeah. in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Judy, have you gotten all this? Heck no. But I'm sure <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the video. There you go. I'm um, getting here, though. Okay, are we done? Any other comments or questions from citizens? Thanks, Emily. Thanks. Uh, I just, I did want to say that um, I've just been very impressed by the capacity, the growing capacity of Home Inc. Um, the work they're doing and the people that are working with them and working for them. It's, it's, it's really positive and the village is really going to need their help in the next year. So I think that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Um, last but not least, Rumkey, 2017-36. This is extending the Village of Yellow Springs contract with Rumkey Incorporated for refuse and recycling services. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, can you hold, help handle this, I hope? Yes. Okay. Um, actually, Patty handled the, the contract um, portion of this, but... I know enough about what's happening that I can at least fill council in. So um, what happened was in 2015, council entered into a two-year contract with Rumpke with the option to extend it for three one-year periods thereafter. So this contract that we have, um, in front, this resolution that we have in front of us is to extend it for one year. Um, so that time period would be from September 1st, 2017 to August 31st, 2018. So this would be the first of three-year options. Um, there are, I don't think, any major changes. Um, the contract is here and um, all of the um, pricing is the same as what it was in the 2015 contract. Um, basically what they did was they, they gave the pricing for all of the, uh, the year multi-year options and so this is just an agreement to extend it for one more year based on those terms. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council? I have a comment. I, I will vote for this, but I want to say that um, in Canada, they recycle all plastics one through seven. Now, I know we have a little different government than Canada does, but you would, I would think that in the United States, we would be able to do the, the same, recycle one through seven, whereas with this current um, contract, the recycling of plastics is really limited and always changing so people never really know what you can recycle in terms of plastic. Now, the Environmental Commission, one of our members is working on this, but okay. just to I, say. That's what I was going to suggest, that, that um, the last time, I, I'm not even sure we got a bid other than from um, uh, yeah. Rumkey, and so, and I don't, I don't know that anybody else is recycling anything. Yeah. But else you'd think either, if they could so. do it in Canada, mm -hmm. 
they can do it. Well, in they're the obviously they, mu they must they be, have different but they, priorities. They I must guess. be supplement. I mean, I'm assuming that there is Maybe. some supplementing Maybe. of it or something. Marianne, just to piggyback on the recycling um, piece of it, there was discussion at the last meeting about. Um, informational piece to residents about recycling and what's acceptable and what mm -hmm. isn't. And um, actually, we had two boxes of these one-page flyers that were provided by Rumpke um, that were updated um, informational pieces about what's able to be recycled and what isn't. And we got those to Smartbill, which is the company that prints our utility uh -huh. bills, and they won't go in the, well, they didn't go in the one that hit for um, July 1st, but they will go in the August oh, bill. Right. So thank you. we're trying. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Any comments or questions from citizens? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Hello. Aye. Hello. What? Oh, I'm sorry, Jerry. I don't think we got an answer on um, why not plastic. <laughs> well, well, this question has been asked of um, yeah, right. before. Um, and they, what they have said is that there's not a market and sometimes there's a market for one kind and sometimes there's a market for another and so a lot of people don't know and they throw in yogurt containers and stuff but they don't recycle those. Although my, it, my experience is, is, that the, is that the waste hauler actually tells people to throw in whatever they have in case something changes because it is so sporadic. I so. Know. I, I mean, I don't know. It's probably going to end up in the landfill, which it would end up in the landfill whether yeah, so. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sometimes you put stuff in that you shouldn't, and then they throw it all in the. In the they're, they uh, supposedly they don't do. They sort it. I mean, they and, and environmental commission has gone to yeah. Remke and yeah. looked, and, and my understanding is that they were pretty comfortable with what they saw there. Um, I mean, certainly everybody would prefer there be more extensive recycling, but they can only do what they can do at this point. Um, did all those in favor signify by saying aye? Aye. aye. Uh, now is the point in the meeting where we hear from citizens about items that are not on the agenda. Um, we ask that you come up to the podium and you have three minutes. Give your name and um, anything? Okay. Um, so the only other thing um, other than reports that uh, um, I asked the uh, there was a, a memo that uh, that Patty prepared um, that I asked her to prepare so um, and I'm sure Emily can answer any questions but when um, in the development agreement um, with Home Inc for Cemetery Street if you recall um, that property was originally going to be a parking lot um, we ended up deciding to sell the lots that we sold to Home Inc. Um, for residential, um, keeping the rest of the property, thinking that maybe it would partially be a parking lot, that, that what was left could be a parking lot. So the idea was that um, a berm would need to be constructed to separate the residential from the parking lot. Um, at this point, I don't know that there is, you know, that there's really a, a big desire to turn it into a parking lot. Um, I don't know that it's something that village staff is really prioritizing. If um, there would be an opportunity to consider um, de residential development on the rest of those lots, having the berm there would be a negative. So at this point, and, and actually, and the development agreement was pretty ambiguous because the development agreement basically <coughs> said, Home Inc. or the village will install a berm. So it wasn't a task that was specifically assigned to Home Inc. So the, the solution that, that Patty came up with is that, is that um, we would just grade it out. I think that there are some things being removed and I think it's going to be graded slightly, but we won't build the berm and then we'll just leave it. If, if it is decided to put a parking lot in there, we can add a berm when we do the parking lot. So it's going to have to be legislation. So I just wanted to give council a, pre, um, the, a preview to that legislation that will be coming at the next meeting. Okay. okay. So um, the manager's report, Melissa, did you want to review what was on there? Um, sure. There was uh, Rumkey, which we just spoke about, um, the solar array. Um, the construction of the fences started around the solar array. That's a really hard word to get out. Um, ribbon cutting is expected in August. 
um, complete streets. Um, so the village is working towards a plan um, with a dig once policy. And um, let's see, it's going to be a long term process, and we still may uh, periodically experience brown water because this is going to include old water lines. Um, so I know that the new plant coming on, a lot of people were really looking forward to improved water, water quality, and I know that um, some of our lines are still very old um, and will need to be. Um, water will be need, need to be ran through those um, so we might still experience periods of that. Bryan Center parking policy, um, there have been a number of issues um, as it pertains to parking at the Bryan Center for events. Um, we've had some issues with our first responders not being able to exit um, as a result of some of those events. So we are going to be looking on or looking at working on a plan for those larger events so that we can ensure that the uh, police department and our emergency equipment are able to exit um, in a in a um, in a manner that's uh, better for everybody here. So um, Sutton Farmhouse is going to be um, burned down by the Miami Township Fire Department on Saturday, July 8th from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, there will be an area for visitors um, and spectators, but there will be no parking at Sutton Farm for the exercise. And parking along 343 will be prohibited, so please don't park along there either. So you'll have to park probably along 68 and uh, take the short walk up the hill. So it looks like that's it from okay. Patty. Your report? Okay, from mine. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, getting back to the uh, Brian Center parking policy. Will that be in place by the, the next street fair? Do we know? Is street fair isn't an issue. I don't think that it will be. I think that the next large event that's going to be happening is going to be Springs Fest. So I think that what they're going to do is they're going to take start taking a look at um, the dynamics and how we might be able to better position either the cruisers or the limit the parking spaces for the people that are having the events. Um, something to that nature. So I think that Springs Fest is going to be kind of the first exercise in figuring out options. So it'll be so kind of a trial be run next year. July. July. This Springs July. Fest is this happening Saturday. this month. Oh, okay, so you, you're hoping to have a better plan. Yes. I mean, we actually have parking passes, and the system that we use for street fair is actually works. It's it's well, pretty organized. So I'm assuming that yeah. there, there'll be some cross feed between the two. Yes. If, if we got a system that appears to, to work, then don't spend the time in reinventing the wheel. Yep. Okay. Can, I, can you just explain very briefly what, how are think, uh, cars parked so that the police were having trouble? I, Brian, do you remember how that it, happened? It was a vendor situation. Oh. At, at the Pride event. Okay. And in a way, I kind of take responsibility because when I arrived, I saw that it was, wasn't was right, but we still had access. And then once, that that's kind of like New Year's Eve, everybody comes at the last minute. And so it was it was very clustered. <laughs> um, but in the future for all events, we're gonna have the, the officers on duty, everyone's gonna be aware. And if we have to, we'll orchestrate, hey, we need to move this truck a little over here, keep the circle open, um, that kind of thing. And we've got, you know, the parking lot is something that we're looking at now, uh, Jason, Johnny, and uh, Patty and myself regarding repaving. Uh, we wanna clean up the front entrance some. We've got that circle down there that really creates kind of a bottleneck. Um, you come around the building and then there are two signs that say you can't go this way. So people have to kind of do the multi-backup to get back out. So we've got some things to work out. I see. Maybe taking those big overgrown ewes out of there that have probably been there since the building was built. And mm -hmm. uh, cleaning up that area, maybe a bigger area for bikes, picnic tables, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. cool. got some stuff on the plate. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I... Also from reading Patty's summary, I got the impression that um, we're going to put some of the onus on the organizers as well, right? We have a plan and so then they need to make sure. You know, vendors, are, <coughs> vendors park where you tell them to park. Mm -hmm. So that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and the other thing, I'm, I'm assuming if you're looking at the parking lot that 
you're looking at the drainage, you're looking at the stormwater that is just pouring across that parking lot. Yeah, Jason's addressing that. Okay. Uh, your assistant manager's report? Yep. Okay, mm -hmm. so um, I know that there have been conversations about the impact of the new water plant um, construction on Jacoby Road. And although Jacoby Road is in Xenia Township, um, a lot of the wear and tear that has happened to the road um, over the course of the water plant construction has been the village's uh, responsibility. So what, um, what is going to happen is Xenia Township is writing a grant um, in order to have that road repaved. And the village was going to contribute towards that since we were such a big um, a big factor in the need for that repaving. So Patty and I had spoken about it and we were going to appropriate $10,000 from the general fund in 2018 to go towards the repair of Jacoby Road and if council would approve that this evening we would be able to give Xenia Township um, that confirmation so that they can go ahead and start writing that grant. So we just need to give them um, approval on whether or not we'll be able to contribute. I move that we um, put $10,000 in the budget for um, to go toward the repaving of Jacoby Road. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 This is a great, this has been a great collaboration. We actually um, stopped Xenia Township from repaving. That road was on their 2017 schedule to repave and we stopped them from doing that. So this has a, been a great collaboration. I think, um, I think actually Bob Geyer, the county engineer, is going to end up doing some work that's going to even improve it more. So that's going to be a good thing. Um, last, the last piece that I had was on Thursday and Friday I attended training from the State Auditor's Office on the finance software that I was looking to um, sign on with. Um, we didn't pay anything for um, any of the up, we didn't pay anything up front for any of this so when I went to the training um, what I realized is the software is really slick and it does a lot of things that I really liked including um, improved uh, financial reporting. However, once I went through the training, I learned very quickly that the conversion process was not something that I was willing to undertake as we would have lost all of our history and everything would have had to have been converted manually. And I was unaware of that fact. So um, it would have been a lot of work. Um, we would have had to input all of our purchase orders and revenues and everything from that have occurred since the beginning of 2017 and our municipality is a much larger one um, in terms of transactional day-to-day um, -day transactions so once I see once I realized that the conversion was not going to be an imported process as it is with most other software programs and it would have to be all manual on the part of uh, Susie and myself um, I started to have, um, I started to reconsider that. So I think that at this point, um, we, we weren't invested in financially in any way. And I think I'm just going to leave this alone um, and just continue on with our current software for now. Um, we're doing the utility billing conversion and the timing of it was going to be really tough in terms of having to convert all of that manually with the utility billing conversion as well. So I'm going to put this on hold. Okay. So that's that for me. And council, was everyone okay with the budget schedule? Everybody going to be in town for those meetings? Okay. Um, Chief. <coughs> Here's your backdrop. Good evening. Good Chief evening. Carlson, <coughs> feels good to say that. Picture. Oh, fantastic! Nice. Um, just on June 23rd, I'm, I'm not sure if you were aware of the details, but I wanted to share them with you. A large truck overturned on the south end of town. It's on Hyde Road, I believe. It was the company that was delivering some of the bouncy houses and things to the event that day. Um, but the wind was horrific. It blew the truck over and it took out the power for many residents on the south end of town. That was early. Um, my thanks to the village employees who were on scene outside all day in the horrible weather working to keep us all safe and regain power. The guys were amazing. I mean, Johnny's crew just 
went at it. Later in the day, after we regained power on the south end of town, a tree fell out of the glen over the bike path and took out a DPNL line, one of the main lines. So Jason, uh, some of the police uh, officers, we were out there taking the tree down to get it off the line, but we had to wait for DPNL to come. That's why we had so much power outage that day. Um, it was inspirational for me to have Jason, Brad, the crew, Ken Metz, off-duty detective Jeff Moore from Xenia, Johnny Burns' crew, other volunteers that showed up to assist in the police matters, and, and we were here till eight or nine at night, and these, these guys really care. And I drove home and I, I thought it was truly inspired in the people that I work with and that we have served in the community here. Bartley stayed on scene uh, to make sure the servers were back up and running. I mean, it was just everybody came together and the little things behind the scene that residents and the public don't get to see. So anyway, I had to share that. On the 24th, the PD participated with uh, Miami Township Fire and Rescue in the Pride Walk through the village in celebration of humanity, our beautiful people, and community. And we had a blast. So unfortunately, next year we're going to have to work out some of the details, uh, but I think we'll do a little better next year with the, the event. Um, this is a repeat, but I know uh, Judith was unaware. I think she had been gone at one of the council meetings, but I do want to give you an update. We did join the uh, Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advising Board. The Ohio Collaborative, a 12-person panel, established state-level policing standards for the first time in Ohio's history on August 28, 2015. The Collaborative works closely with law enforcement agencies to implement compliance standards uh, across the board within the department from tech to policy to, to how we interact with the community with an expectation that each member department meet or exceed these standards. Um, th I think this is important because um, the big compliance group in the United States for law enforcement is CALEA and we're such a small department that we can't the expense of that just isn't justified. But uh, Ohio Collaborative is available now to all sides agencies, and we're going to be able to, to kind of cherry pick some policy we don't have that we can amend later, but we'll, that will bring us up to compliance. For example, implicit bias policy, which we don't currently have. So we'll put that in. Once we reach the standards and we can pass, then we can come back, regroup, and do things how we'd like. So I'm excited about that. Um, I mentioned to Patty in my last meeting, I'm real interested in feedback regarding interactions with officers and dispatchers. So to the citizens, please call, call me, email me anytime with comments, good or bad, I need to know. Otherwise, I don't know. And um, we've been getting a lot of positive feedback on some things that we share within the building and it's kind of building camaraderie. Uh, but please talk with family, friends, your children. Ask them to say hello to when they see officers. Strike up a conversation if they can. And again, just let us know how things are going. Last but not least, and I don't want to ramble on, but I did want to give you an update on what's on my front burner, if you will. Uh, Patty and I are working to put together a job description for a police social worker. I think that's uh, prudent. I think it's something on a daily basis I'm seeing the need for more and more and how that would work for us. So we'll be working on that hopefully within the next few months. Maybe by year's end we can have that employee in place. Um, Judy and I are going to have lunch <coughs> uh, in two weeks down at Miracle Clubhouse. Uh, they uh, work with developmentally disabled and most importantly there, uh, substance abusers who have turned their life around. And so I have met with several of them and they have volunteered to come in and speak with our officers about their former lives as heroin addicts living on the streets in Cleveland and Columbus and how they have turned their lives around and, and work today, which I think would just be wonderful. Walks with an officer are gonna start um, the end of July, we'll have our first meeting and then we're gonna start that in August. The, <coughs> excuse me, the program that we wanted to put together, that Chrissy's gone now, but uh, the village is going to donate our bicycles once they're cleared through the court system to Brian's group, and then without us being even involved, the schools are going to help us get those out to the kids that need them. Awesome. And that's pretty much it. Great. Any questions? Uh, one quick one, Brian. Do you think it would be a good idea related to feedback to set up um, 
uh, the option of anonymous feedback? Absolutely. A box or something? Absolutely. Okay. Well, a box would be great. That makes it personal that way. Um, I'm also working on getting our web page vamped up because we really don't have anything. <coughs> we have a picture with old employees. And so those are things that are on the back burner, but yeah, I, I agree. Okay. Brian, uh, the, the office is still carrying uh, bike lights with them? Yes. And the reason I, I bring that up, because still seeing, and it's, it's mostly the adults now, riding their bikes at night with no lights. Right. Anybody we see, we try to give yeah. them to. Okay. Like that. And another project you may be aware of, I, I don't know if you've been contacted, um, the Senior Center has uh, received a grant um, to do a um, uh, dementia study a de and, and basically to set up a program called Dementia uh, Friendly Yellow Springs. So that's going to go across. Um, they're going to work with the chamber on, on bringing businesses in, obviously the police department on, on training police officers. So I've encouraged Kate um, Leve is it Levecon? Yeah. Yeah. Le to potentially coordinate. I don't know if there's a coordination there with NAMI, um, but there could be. So I think she just reached out in the last couple of days. Right. So it's just another another one of those things that I think is going to set us apart and uh, bring more opportunity to be more inclusive Fantastic. and awesome. friendly and welcoming. Thanks for doing the bike thing. I think that's great. Oh yeah. Well, thank you, Brian. And we'll, we'll get it. And I guess yeah, the, the, you, the bikes that we that aren't usable. You found a place in Springfield that, that yeah. they teach kids how to fix bikes? Yep. So. And then once they go through the program, they get the bike. Yeah. And so I think that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank Great. you very much. Thank well, you. Uh, I'll say one more. <laughs> Since this is our last uh, official meeting before the 4th of July tomorrow, is there anything that the citizens need to know about parking? And, and that, It'll be as it usually on. is. Um, we're going to do the best we can with our signs. Ken Metz is out. Um, he hurt his back. So he usually is, uh, plays a big part in that. But I've got myself, Naomi will be on that tomorrow all day. We put, there's no parking on West South College end to end. Um, we'll have the no police tape up where there's no parking. The lot will be for handicap as always. We will have officers letting people in and out. Um, just be respectful and enjoy yourselves I think you know Colin is going to make the call whether we cancel or not and it will be late so if in other words if he makes the call he may wait as late to, as 9 p.m. but we've called it earlier we decided in the past and then the rain went away and so we wanted to give the public the opportunity to still enjoy it since Great. we don't have a rain date this mm -hmm. year thanks mm -hmm. Brian thank you Judy well, this is a little bit repetitive, but I'm going to read it anyway because it's not horribly late, and uh, I do want to give the shout-out. So it's been very busy. My job is out of sync with most other employees in terms of busy times because I work around council meeting schedules, and they mostly work directly on village utilities and safety. So that gave me, gave me a pretty inactive front seat for last, and that would be the previous last, Friday's series of unfortunate events and left me, as it does every time, very appreciative of my fellow employees and very grateful for the work they do. And as Brian mentioned, there was an overturned semi which cut off power, and that meant that dispatch and the village manager's office were immediately flooded with phone calls. PD was engaged in traffic control, accident reports, first responder duties, the electric crew was responding to the downed line. Shortly thereafter, then the limb fell and took out the DPNL line, which cut powered most of the rest of the village. Then the streets crew was out to remove the limb, electric crew, crew to shut off any live wires. Streets folks could cut up tree limbs and place barricades and call the DPNL regularly to prod them into action. Um, and then more incoming phone calls, increasing citizen concern, and those were handled by the manager's office, Ruth Ann, dispatch, Ken Rita, also the women in the utilities office got a honk load of calls because people weren't certain why their utilities were out. So through this continuous downpour, these employees kept at their jobs. They were working to respond to citizens, maintain traffic safety, and restore power. Then at the tail end of that day, a village employee was injured in a car accident, and again out went the PD, the streets crew, the manager, to work the scene and provide support. 
So lunch didn't happen, breaks didn't happen, angry folks were listened to and respect, respectfully responded to. Worried citizens were reassured. All this went on around me like standing in the eye of a pretty focused hurricane. I was and I am very proud of village staff for their obvious dedication and concern, and it sort of puts how much I loathe doing minutes into perspective. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Judy. We all need that reminder, and thanks. Yeah. It was that was one heck of a day, but every day can be um, have its challenges. So thank you. Uh, future agenda items. So July 17th, we've removed the lodging tax follow-up discussion. Um, so we will we have this? Will we have these two from Planning Commission? No, there will there will only be the addition of the pocket neighborhood developments. The ordinance amending uh, the definition of short term rentals is taken out. Okay. Do we know about the fire advisory board report, Brian? Do you have any idea? I know they're planning to. Yeah. Do it at the next meeting. Yep. Okay. Tim and Tim. Okay. Yeah, because Patty met with them, and yeah, they've got. Yeah, I talked to two of their members. Okay. They, they mentioned that they were coming because I I'm not going to be at that meeting, so I. Okay. Was, mm. um, and is the HRC annual report on? <laughs> well, one hopes. Okay. I just keep moving it right along. Okay. Like can down the road. So, did you need a resolution approving the grading of the land on home? I'm not oh, yes, sure yes. how to yeah. frame that. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Burn. Just the burn. Just. It's green. Patty will know. It's no. It's the removal of the berm okay. from the development agreement. Okay, I'll we'll get that straightened away. And then, do you want to put on ordinance increasing tap fees on for August twenty first? Oh no. I mean, I think we haven't even begun to talk about it, have we? I know staff has done, had done a fair amount of work some time ago. Well, I think I'd like to get a report from staff on yeah. recommendation before we do an ordinance. Yeah. ordinance. Mm. So tap fee discussion maybe or something on the Right, because I, I mean, and I want to understand exactly what those equipment costs are mm -hmm. that are half referenced. Okay. Uh, are, are you talking about all the... I mean, tap feet, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm not going to be at the next council meeting, but I wondered, uh, so maybe the Let's August. Let's add it to August 21 because um, it doesn't look like we have that much for August 21st. Yet. Us enough time to right. Make. I wondered if we wanted to review um, the 2017 goals um, since we're a little over half year, halfway through the year, kind of progress. Yeah, progress, refocus. Prioritize. So August twenty, August twenty-one. Yeah, that's what I was going to suggest. Yep. Okay, um, and then we have the lodging tax ordinance. Oh, and that will be coming on or the discussions. Yeah, on the twenty-first of August, <coughs> and the second reading will be on the fifth of September. And Marianne's asking that staff do a written report on that. I mean, I know we've got Chris's information. What, what I would like to know from staff is um, what kind, uh, if any, regulations they think need to be in place for the alternative lodging facilities, which would include short-term rental apartments as well as bedrooms in people's houses, and uh, a, an, a sense of the kind of work that would be in involved for staff regarding that mm -hmm. what I would I would suggest because we've got a number of pieces of paper separate pieces of paper that are kind of summarizing that issue is that if staff would write a single staff report meeting summarizing it and that would include what you found out would include some of the summarizing Chris I mean Chris's legal opinion stands on its own but maybe summarizing the legal opinion um, what what you may find out from Green County basically putting everything the uses of the money basically putting everything that's been generated into one report rather than having a bunch of disparate pieces of paper mm -hmm. what's our timing on 
That will be for the 21st, 21st. August 21st. Because that's when the draft yes, ordinance the is coming? Yeah, that kind of thing, but short term, not long. Um, so at this point, it doesn't look like, other than that, that, well, we've got, so for, for September 5th, we have 20, no, we don't, we don't have anything else except the yeah. second reading yeah. of the lodging yeah. tax yeah. for that's September what we, 5th. That's what we talked about. And then, um, basically the rest of the uh, the rest of the agenda is budget schedule which that will obviously start filling in as we move along um, council are we um, are we going to um, entertain a motion to return to our executive session yes I move that we re that after this meeting is complete we return to our executive session uh, can we, you just we have to exit of, this for the purpose of um, pending or imminent court action. Okay, well, I'm sorry, was there a second? Yes. Yes, Jerry. Thank you. Winter. Yes. Tausch. Yes. Sims. Yes. Queen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Dorothy. <coughs>